Hello there. Uh, hope everyone can hear me okay, and I hope the sound is good. Let me do one sound check real quick. I got to make sure it's going to the right microphone. Hang on one second. Sound. Uh, input to internal mic. Yeah, okay, everything's okay. I'm going to turn the input volume down just a little so I don't blow anybody too far. And I'm going to have about like that. Okay. Um, <laughs> hey, Card. Good to see you at the beginning. <laughs> Hi, Matthias. And Port Val, Nick, and Easy. Oh, we say howdy here. here. <laughs> How you guys doing? Hi, May son. Um, well, let me see if we can get on track with this. And uh, I'm, I'm glad there's some uh, Rolex people here because there were some questions relative to what we're going to be uh, talking about here. Well, uh, the, the topic is, and a lot of people had some really good feedback about this, and that is, um, okay, so you got these groups like Reach Mall. And uh, within the groups, you have a longer, uh, you have uh, Vesseron Constantin, Shaja Lukutra, all of these uh, very well known uh, watchmaking uh, companies, hybrids, buddy. And so, what, what they're thinking, okay, this is on the economy of scale. Maybe we ought to start putting some kind of factory together and so we can make movements of at least a certain kind for some of these. Now, the, the ones that I had in the video were um, sort of a replacement for an ETA uh, 6498 or 6497, one of those two, that um, Panerai was uh, using. And so now, instead of using an ETA, uh, hi, Neil, uh, hi, Paul. Um, and so, <laughs> okay, I, hey, Paul, Paul is a Rolex lover. <laughs> How you doing, Paul? Okay, the, um, the, the, um, hi, Kurt. So what I wanted to look at, or what about this? I hear you have, uh, this one company called Val Fleurier. Uh, located in the Fleurier area with all of these great independents like Beauvais. I have all my Beauvais, by the way. And um, Wooten Lannan and um, oh, let me see who else is there. Uh, oh, Parma Gianni. You know, so you, you got these and, and then Vosher movements. And so now you have another one in, in uh, Fleurier. And notice that they called it Val Fleurier. I, I don't think that was a mistake. They could have called it Reachmont Movements or something like that, but they didn't. They wanted to identify it with Fleurier. At least I think they did. Hi, Kurt. Um, so, uh, wristwatch check. You see you wearing your Beauvais. Yeah, I, there's my Beauvais. Um, hey, hey, Beauvais. <laughs> uh, yeah, I figured well with blue. I got my blue stuff. I got my blue square, you know. All right, um, so let's let's talk about the what I want to what I want to talk about. What do you think about these these making uh, sort of the the mothership, if you will, the Richemont or the uh, Louis Vuitton? It's Louis Vuitton Monet at Hennessy, I think, is the name of another big group. Uh, there are about two or three of them, and they're making. Um, these all of these watches hi mark and so are all of these watch movements now if you look at the vacheron constantin that they came out with they wanted to come out with a an entry level and i'm glad they did i i really think it's important for vacheron constantin because it's a company i happen to like a lot and so they came out with the 56 and they had three different movements now two of the movements on their watches have the Geneva seal. 
And the third one doesn't. And the third one is, I forgot what the number on it was, but that's the least expensive one is the entry level is 11,900. Now, my hunch is, <laughs> as a, if, if I had to bet on something, I, uh, these are all 40 millimeter, by the way. I wouldn't be surprised if next year that they come out with a 36 millimeter and they use exactly the same movement. And here's why I think that's possible. The 40 millimeter case uh, is, and the 36 millimeter case, but you've got like a 26, I think it's 26 millimeter movement that that'll fit in either one of those cases. And, and this is how come I like movements that really fit the cases. Uh, I, I keep showing this as an example. I mean, here was a watch and a, and a movement that were made for each other. You can see that, that the thing fits it like a glove. You don't see a lot of that. Uh, instead, what you see is you'll see a relatively small movement that'll fit a lot of different sizes. Okay, that's neither here nor there. Uh, uh, hi, Rasher. Uh, the what I'd like to get your your thoughts on is that is there some good for us as collectors that would come out of this? In other words, here you have this company making lots and lots of movements. And these are high horology companies. Uh, some of them may not be so high. And th this is another thing. Here you have um, uh, Bohm and Mercier. Uh, they're having their movements made by them. And of course, they're under the uh, Richemont umbrella too. So, hi, William. Uh, so what are, your, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, do you think this is, uh, well, this is a good idea because you have the... Um, economy of scale and so you're not having to buy just a few things but you buy a lot and that way you can sort of use different gears let's say or some other kinds of parts on different uh, movements that you're making or uh you're sort of gathering a lot of experts watchmakers together uh what are some of your thoughts that you have any anybody uh, or do you think uh, this might be a not so good thing? Uh, do you think this is going to sort of take out the incentive of the companies? Uh, like, uh, let me go back to Bassarone Content 10. They made this fantastic movement. I think it was in 2016 that came out in their overseas, but it also came out in their Quadrilio, and which was about five thousand dollars less and. The, this is one of the things that I've always had at the back of my mind about, wow, you know, that's something I ought to get my hands on pretty soon because it is a great movement. I mean, it really is. They did a lot of work. I read all about it. And the uh, 5100 that they put in there is really something. Now, on the other hand, and it has the Geneva seal. You can find on in condition zero, you can find easily uh, quite a little stainless steel quite a little with the 5100 movement in it which has the Geneva seal for around the same price as the entry level 56 which is eleven thousand nine hundred dollars so for in that price range in fact less than that you can get a better watch uh, which is exactly what I would do uh, if I didn't have all the other ones on my list I have to get first Okay, economics, uh, Jack. Uh, yeah, they, they did it for economics. And the question is, is that um, you know what, what about that? Uh, let's see, Paul. You have it. It'll promote them to cut corners. You spend serious money. It should be done independently. Well, you know, Paul, one of the things about Rolex, you know, they knock out 1.4 million watches a year, and they seem to do a pretty good job. Okay, too expensive to employ the people and keep the shop down. Uh, downtime will kill. Um, okay, Jack. Boy, uh, hi, toy culture. Um, hmm. Mm, 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 mm. 
Okay, uh, Encart, uh, I think it's a good idea that watch groups are making their own manufacturers as long as you disclose the origin of the movement and not sugarcoat it with the in-house. In-house uh, to me means exclusive. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but when you when you start looking at, you know, the numbers that they're doing, I don't, I mean, you take something like the Vassarone Contentine 56. How many of those do you think they're going to make? I would guess, and I have no reason, I have no basis for this, but let's say they make 10,000. Well, on the other hand, you got Rolex making 1.4 million, so it's a drop in a bucket by comparison. And, you know, there you have this huge manufacturing uh, enterprise. In fact, it's, I think, I don't think any of them are, are bigger than that. Uh, maybe Citizen or one of the big ja or Seiko or one of the big Japanese companies. But but I don't I'm, I don't think so. And I don't think that as a group, Richemont sells as many as Rolex. But was in now you mentioned that um, uh, in one of the arguments I hear for using ETA. <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> One of the arguments for using ETA, it's easy to find someone to fix them. And that's true. That's very true. But I'll bet you that uh, P6000 that um, Val Fleurier made for Panerai to replace the 6498, if, if you look at the, um, the plates on those things, they cover it all up. You can't see it. All right. And I'll bet if you pop them off, it looks a lot like the 6498. <coughs> Hi, Quan. <coughs> mm. Boy. Um, I walked outside right beforehand, and I got <coughs> they were flying around. Okay, the number of units for Rolex is pretty high. Yes, yeah, extremely high, uh, Jack. Uh, and uh, Paul, Rolex strive for evolutionary improvement. Both good points. Yeah, they do. Uh, but the evolutionary improvement <laughs> don't do anything quickly <laughs> the evolution i think that's what it's sort of a you know i thought we're going to get new oil wait until we can grow more dinosaurs or something okay just kidding i love rolex and that's on my list i want to get a cellini prince so so there um here's the other thing all right you talk about uh, economy of scale and and we talk about you know high horology. Somebody mentioned exclusive exclusivity. Well, all of these things come to be more expensive. And is it possible? Is that what they're trying to do? Is keep it at that same price, lower the production price, and and increasing the profit? Um, I think so. But if they're doing that, what happens? The the next step inevitably not only with with this but just with so many businesses they start looking for corners to cut well if we took a little of this out here or or didn't quite use the same quality of metal in our in our gears or you know there are all kinds of little corners now if you're making millions of watches these little little cuts can end up to add up to a lot a lot of money coming in the door so anyhow okay rolex cypher evolution all right i got that um the brand should be protected as far as servicing is concerned but service centers should also include independent um hmm. now That is sort of, I'm not sure how to respond to that, uh, William. Um, hi, South NC. Um, that, is, that is a very, the whole issue of supporting their service centers. There's some watches that the only place I'll take them is to their brand service center. The Beauvais is one of them. My Epijorns are another. On the other hand, um, oh my, this is my Raymond Weil with its Summit ETA in it. I forgot what which kind it has. But you know, I can go down to 
to these guys you know, on the on the top of their their uh, workbenches, watch repair for dummies, and they can fix it. Okay, let's see what we got. In house seems to mean different things to different people. It's like a minefield. I like watches. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, but I like watches. It, since it does mean different, it, it does have a lot of meanings. What do you think? Um, that that a good meaning for us as collectors. Now, this is so much. Every all of the discussions have been based upon what's good for the watch companies. Now, I'm all for the watch companies doing well because without the watch companies, we wouldn't have watches. On the other hand, uh, you know, I try to look at ways that watch collectors aren't going to get bamboozled. Uh, South End C, uh, you made a good point. I mean, you got companies like uh, um, that are using Agenhor and La Fabrique, uh, Fabrique du Temps uh, to develop extraordinary movements. Yes, uh, but those are like mucho expensive, except for that deal I got on, on my Harry Winston with a Agenhor module to it. Uh, for the retrograde, but yeah, the, now see, this is the thing: is that can you know? Let, uh, there's a couple watches uh, in the Grand Prix that ha both have movements that are entirely by Agenhor. Agenhor usually makes uh, some kind of module, but here a couple watches now they now they have an entire movement. So let's say that uh, somebody says, "Well, look, you know, we're gonna we're gonna produce all of these watches." In fact, let's let's say, let's say that uh, Val Fleurier uh, would like to do that. They go to uh, um, Jean Marc Viterac and say, "Look, we'd like to use your movements, and uh, we'll pay you X amount of you know so that to give us the wherewithal, and we'll develop the uh, machinery and everything to make them." Can they make them in the same way that they're made now in a much smaller numbers and a much more expensive ones? Okay, let's see what we got. Um, uh, these movement makers can do anything. I agree with that. So that creativity is not restricted for someone who wants to develop a unique watch instead of using only available in-house movement. Yeah, they can. And they... <coughs> Man, and they charge a lot for it. By the way, uh, we're on the other side of the country. We're in Connecticut, uh, but we we heard on TV is that some of the air quality has gotten um, a little iffy because of the fires out on the west coast. That's how bad those fires have become. If if I, if it's a volcano in Hawaii, that's a little too close. Okay, let's see what we got here. Swatch are obsessed with manufacturing rather than traditional values. They advertise some traditional work, then they cut corners focusing on uh, efficiency over quality. Now, Paul, um, if you talk to some people that you, especially uh, smaller independents who, who use ETA, um, they'll give you an argument about that. In fact, what, what 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 uh, I I said I have a uh, Pazu seven thousand one in my um, El La Raw, and uh, a guy who is started it up an in independent. I said something to the effect that well, it's just like you know the Pazu that uh, was made before it was taken over by ETA, and I was told mm -hmm, they improved it. So um, I don't know, you know. <laughs> which is which. But for the most part, I, I don't think that ETA is the same quality uh, that you get in, like, let's say, uh, something with a Geneva seal on it by uh, Vesseron Constantin, all right? Uh, that is... In, in, in the workmanship and everything else that goes into it and the quality of the of the materials. Uh, and the same may be said 
uh, for Rolex. Um, you know, what, what do they use? Well, they use what they tell us they use. <laughs> They're very secretive about everything. But they make the, the they even forge their own metal. And so, you know, anything that goes wrong with their stuff isn't because uh, they got a bad batch out of, uh, you know, Timbuktu or something like that. Okay, Visionaire DDZ1 GPH for the division 2016. Ah, cool. Uh, Van Cleef and Arpel's Midnight Oil Day. Oh, I love that watch. Oh, that Van Cleef watch. Hours here and hours there. That is the coolest watch. Um, and Visionaire DTZ1 the GPH. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the winners of the Grand Prix, especially when you look at the watches won by the ladies and ladies' uh, complications, you'll see a lot of of um, stuff that that have been made by Agenhor. Really amazing stuff. Okay, take the Sandoz family. Just because you buy a bunch of different companies. <laughs> and then call it in-house, but is it really? Can you argue both ways, I guess? Um, yeah, you can. Uh, the Sandoz family is is really interesting. By the way, too, it's, um, you, you, I'm assuming all of you have heard of Jacquet Gros watchmakers. Uh, they made their big splash in China initially, and then they're now they're sort of coming back. They're more in Europe than they are in the U.S., but in what was it, 1748, uh, Jacques Droz uh, married Marianne San Sandoz. That'll give you an idea <laughs> how far back uh, the families go. Uh, sorry about that. It was a bit of, I don't know, if it was trivia or gossip. But anyway, okay, so the Sandoz family, what the Sandoz family did, though, is a little different. Um, the Sandoz family wanted to create a, they wanted to have a vertically organized watch making company. And Vosseur was like this, okay, if we're, we're going to make these high quality movements in Vosseur movements, and they, and they, they simply, they certainly charge high horology prices for their, for Vosseur movements. And you look at the Vosseur movements and they're, a higher quality than your uh, than you're going to see, like something out of ETA or even um, well, or Salida or one of the other. Um, oh, there's another company that makes I can't think of their name right now. They make sort of ETA clones, but uh, they were bought by um, a Spanish company called such of an F. I can't think of the name of it. But they also bought uh, Ella Raw and haven't done anything with it. And uh, I don't know if they're going to do anything with this movement company, which I think is, is something that uh, is considered sort of an upscale ETA clones. Who knows? Okay. Um, oh, holy smoke. Okay. I'm, I'm for that. <laughs> I got to find out what it's referenced to. Uh, Rolex makes their own uh, loom too. Rolex makes everything. They got a. They they have. Uh, I was most impressed when I found out that they forged their own uh, metal. That, that was wild. Uh, but you know the thing is, is that I don't think most Rolex buyers, and I could be wrong. And correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, they tend to have. Don't they have? Um, don't they tend to have? Um, what are they called? Um, Oh, stainless steel. Aren't most of the ones that people buy stainless steel? I never think of them. Yeah, they have gold watches. I know that. In fact, I think they may even have platinum ones, and they have white gold and so forth. But I don't think too many of Rolex buyers are as interested in those as they are in the steel model. Like I said, correct me if I'm wrong about that. Okay, Rolex didn't own the company that made its movement until 2003, I believe. That may be right. I don't know. Uh, except for the hair springs. I heard that Rolex buy the hair springs from someone else. Is that correct? Oh, boy. Uh, they came out with a really interesting one. Rolex hair springs, I do, I do believe the ones that are in the date just, they do move, make. And it's made out of a combination of 
Im Imobium and um, something else, uh, Silconium. Okay, now those two, the idea, of course, is that you you have it and it doesn't doesn't ever need adjusting. Okay, um, and that, that's sort of a, but I do think they do make at least some of the hairsprings and they have a name, Pachimon or something like that. They have a name, something like that. Um, it, the companies that make their own hairsprings are few and far between. Um, Beauvais is one that makes them. Um, uh, Moser makes their own. I'm trying to think who else. Parmigiani makes their own. Um, who else? Most hairsprings, most of, most of the hairsprings are made by ETA, and they make a very good one. Uh, the ones that they make are, um, uh, I forgot what the material is, but it's a kind of material that stays uh, as a hairspring. Seiko makes theirs, I'm not surprised. Um, Rolex movements were made by Aigler from the start. Rolex purchased them. Okay, uh, thanks, Paul. That's the then I guess you know when you talk when when you talk about an in-house for certain companies, uh, you're really talking about some kind of relationship that they have or ownership of a a branch that you that does a specialized thing that makes movements, that makes hair springs or something like that. Um, Parmigiani is very much uh, vertically organized that way, and they are owned by uh, all owned by the uh, Sandoz family. In fact, the Sandoz family organized it that way. Um, so yeah, that's that's not unusual. Uh, with Beauvais, uh, it's a little simpler. They have Beauvais, and then they have Demier. Demier makes all of the parts, and with H Moser, they have um, I forgot the name of their. Uh, the one that they own that makes all of their stuff for them. But that's that's quite common. They make them for, uh, you know, I would imagine companies, I'm, I'm not sure about it, whether F.P. Jorn makes their own hairsprings or not, or um, a Root and Lanin or um, Ferrier. I mean, these guys are really, I mean, it's, it takes a lot to make your own hairspring. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if they got them for one of these other high-end companies. Okay, uh, Seiko makes them. Uh, Seiko makes hairsprings for Rolex. Well, if Aigler makes them, I don't know. No, I meant Seiko make their own. Ronin. Okay. All right. Um, where are we now? Yeah, so, so, so I think that the direction that everyone is going um, uh, Paul, you sound like a, you're advertising that. How do you know they're everything? <laughs> Rolex, everything is consistent and, and quality, constant, and progressive. Oh boy. Okay, a bit slow though. All right. Um, <laughs> man, <laughs> you got you love your Rolexes. Uh, I like them too. I like Rolexes. Um, <laughs> there, there's one on my list. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Well, okay, I better sort of it's getting time to wrap this up. We've got about a minute left. Um, so anyway, it's an interesting development, and I'm very interested to see uh, where this may go in the future. Um, I, I don't know. I, it could either be, you know, Val Fleurier could turn into another ETA, uh, or it could turn into another um, Vacheur. Either way, uh, one going to the uh, really top quality, hey, Aza, uh, and the other going somewhere else. All right, so we'll see what happens. Okay, hey, listen, uh, thanks everyone for dropping by, uh, and I see. Hope to see you next uh, Friday. Take care.